Dude, I got. I wore these for you, man. Oh, you uh, I've seen those before. <laughs> these, those are great. These, those are fucking awesome. Yeah, and they have great. pointy ears. Yeah, they do. Those are incredible. Those are great. Do you own these? Uh, I think my Where boyfriend has a pair of those. Where the hell did you actually. get those? <laughs> At the Mall of America in Minneapolis. I was just fantastic. there visiting a friend for a wedding, and I was like, I gotta get these for my Star Trek. Interviews. Love it. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's, you score great points. The only thing it's missing is just a little thing of. Fucking hair right here. <laughs> that would, yeah, that would oh be my awesome. God. Well, congratulations, you guys. Um, I was nerding out because I think Justin Lin did a phenomenal job, and I'm wondering during the first crawl attack when you're sliding down those hallways um, as, as the Enterprise. Kind of sliding down the, yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. Are, are you really sliding down? Yeah, like, they lit, he built. Uh, it was very important to Justin to have everything be practical, so they were all built on. Um, What's the word? Hydraulic lift. Hydraulic lift, so that you could actually cant this whole thing. <sighs> the, the hallways like this, you could can it. So basically, it was like completely vertical. And so, yeah, we did a lot of that on wires and stuff. It was crazy. That's insane. Yeah. Now, one of the things I love about cinema, and this just kind of a more serious question, is I love that when, when someone does pass on in real life, they live on through movies. Like, and the beauty is you can put a movie on and still see that person. You know, I can watch Anton and Charlie Bartlett and watch him in Star Trek. I'm just curious what that means to you as actors to have that ability to be kind of timeless, like in, mm. in cinema. And what, what do you think that means for Anton to have been in these movies with you guys? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, um, it's an interesting way to think about it. I've actually watched a couple of his movies in the last month um, to, to feel connected to him and seeing him in this movie actually was surprisingly, uh, I would say, uh, there was a, a, a joy to seeing him because uh, he's so good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it is a way to... to um, preserve someone or an aspect of someone's um, talent, uh, certainly, and personality in some ways. Um, the way that we, we honor Leonard in this film as well, yeah. you know, um, it was important to me that, that, that he be a part of the story, not just to have it be a kind of peripheral uh, acknowledgement, but that he factor in. And, and to me, it's almost like a reflection of my personal relationship with Leonard, where his version of Spock still sort of teaching my version of Spock, guiding me, mm. uh, even though he's not there anymore. And I think that's, uh, that's how I feel about Leonard in my life as a person. So yeah, it's a, a, a unique way of looking at it and, and maybe one that can bring us some measure of comfort in this like unfathomable time of feeling Anton's absence. You know, one thing I love about your character, I, I, I always find it fascinating to watch him on screen. I'm wondering when you do go out, like when the camera cuts and you go off uh, to take a break or whatever, do you do you stay in Spock, no. like, character? You're not, like, method like that. I just feel like no. the character's so <laughs> That would intense. be the most boring experience in my entire <laughs> life if I did that. Like, ordering uh, lunch that way? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, uh, I, I don't stay in character. Yeah. Uh, the best is to watch Zach try to handle some absurd amount of techno... <laughs> technological dialogue and then he'll he'll like fumble a line he'll just be, oh, god damn it <laughs> I'll take it from the top no I I'll take it from I have a lot of stuff to say what's the line again uh, what's the line just okay. say the word <laughs> it. Um, yeah we, we have a good time there's a there's a general sense of levity on, on set I think all of us um, enjoy coming back to ourselves after you know the sequences that we're in well guys it's an honor to meet you Congratulations on the film. Thank you very much. Out the best Beastie Boys sabotage <laughs> ever in a movie, man. You guys are awesome. You know, one thing I love, I love that Justin did in this film is that he explores the the outside lives of these characters. And, like, yeah. I've never thought... Like, when Kirk says, I'm going to call home to my mom, and then we see your character show up, and, we, and he sees his husband and his daughter, I love the way it was handled. It was handled, handled as a normalcy, which is how it should be handled. Yeah. And I'm wondering, just for you as an actor, did you know that Sulu was gay, but when you first took on the role in 2009, was that something you had already written in your mind or is that written in just this script no i'd assumed he was straight based upon the fact that uh the character that george takei played was straight but not that it mattered i mean uh, but uh i had assumed that uh based upon the original series um yeah but uh now i i wonder if i did everything wrong that's what I'm wondering though. Does, does it change at all the character you played in the first two films? I don't think it does. I think I think the point is that he's at his job and it doesn't make a difference. Like the personal life is not really, doesn't really um, matter in the professional life. And I think that's 
that's a that's yeah to me that's that's a statement there there's a great line in the film that carl urban says he talks about um you spend so much time trying to be your father and it says instead of you know now you need to figure out who you really want to be and i'm wondering as actors is it hard do you ever lose yourselves in roles and almost like not not forget who you are but like is it hard to like come back to yourself after playing a role it's not easy to go back to your normal routine. You know, we're creatures of habit, so if you've been rehearsing or practicing a different mannerism for a character, um, it's, it's only a matter of time until you, it's, it's just it's muscle memory, so you just start doing it naturally. So to come away from that also takes a little bit of time. I did find myself when I was um, prepping for Avatar and I was shooting it that I would hiss. I was hissing. I just kept hissing. And I, I didn't, my mother was the one that told me at the dinner table. She was like, can you just stop hissing? And I had no idea that I was doing it. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Well, I found that, you know, sometimes you're in a, I mean, I, it's not that bad for me, but sometimes if you're, you, you, you get in a mood, you know, like. A rhythm, the, yeah. A rhythm, I don't know. Sometimes it takes a few weeks to, to sort of, before you realize, oh, I was in a mood um, or in this particular no, place. Back, yeah. It can be a dark place. It can be a, you know, a too funny place or yeah. a, a mischievous place but uh it takes a little while to get back but if you have a family it, it accelerates that I, this is totally nerdy but i would love to see Harold this is Ku so nerdy kumar dropped into a star trek film oh that would be fun what would they do on the enterprise <laughs> i have to know what like, they would it's do it's like Harold and kumar go beyond <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what would they do on the enterprise um they would be searching for intergalactic weed <laughs> And um, they would be, you know, flora and fauna on other planets, uh, yes. smoking it. And uh, I feel like <laughs> this is my favorite answer of all time. <laughs> this is so good. Yeah, and they maybe would... finding a white castle. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a fan of how the transporting works in the movie. So you have like, there's literally a shot in the film where Carl Urban says something, turns around, Quinto transports, and then is it? Do you shoot it twice? How, how do you do that moment? I'm, <laughs> Well, we have to shoot it multiple times, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you like you shoot it once with him, once without him, and then mm -hmm. you're like, that's such an interesting. Well, it's funny. It was like we have all this high tech stuff, but we also did one take where, you know, Carl's talking and then Zach would run away. <laughs> so as as high tech as everything is, we still had the old school stand there and run away. Now, when you have during the first attack, attack that Carl has on, on the Enterprise, I mean, you have these incredible shots where Pine and is like sliding down the hallways. How much of that is actually in camera versus actual sets moving? It's amazing, you know, I, I, it's 50th anniversary and I assume that they would have shakers and, and rotating sets, but they never had it. This is the first film in the, in the franchise to do that. Really? And so, yeah, I mean, we have, you, we, I'm sure we have footages of it. Um, I actually built the set where it goes 360 around. And so <laughs> the actors would show up and they look and it, we would be moving the, sh you know, the whole set. And oh yeah, Chris, when he was lighting, he was lighting. Is he on wires? Uh, like sometimes, sometimes. Wow. Yeah, but it was it was one of those things where I felt like the body articulation was very important. So we just build the sets accordingly. Um, you know, obviously, I, I re I've been reading a lot of news recently about the John Cho character, Sulu. Obviously, I, I I love that you did. It. I love how you did it. It was just yeah. completely normal. Yeah. It was like you just see it happen, and it's it. Yeah. And I love how you presented it. So I'm wondering, was that the point? Was to was to just show it as a normalcy? I, I love that idea. That it all came from this idea of you know, we I grew up with the original series, and you saw the crew, and every night they had a huge challenge that they had to overcome. But after seeing it, you know, reruns a few times, and then you start thinking about what's happening outside the screen. Mm. Like, do Chekhov and Sulu hang out after, <laughs> or do they not like each other? And what happens if Kirk's not around with, and Bones and Spock are kind of just standing there? What Do they interact? And that, I remember talking to Simon and Doug, and I said, we gotta present those moments, those mm. slice of life moments, you know? And so it was a very organic way of, of, of kind of uh, presenting that. That was the, the impetus for, for for any of those moments, you know, and that was almost like a dream come true. Like it's been in my head for since I was eight, you know. And so, wow. you know, part of it was that we wanted to see Sulu uh, with his family, you mm. know. Um, and to do it, I do feel like, you know, whatever it was going to be, whether it's Sulu or, or Spock or anybody, the presentation of it, you know, is more of like 
this should be more matter of fact because this, this shouldn't be an issue. That's why I loved yeah. it because it was just like, this is just how life is. Yeah. That's why I thought you did it perfectly. Well, no, I think one thing I love about your movie is Michael Giacchino's score. And I know yeah. he's been around since the oh. 2009 film. Yeah. And that original theme, that da -da -da, yeah, yeah. It's, it's an amazing piece of music. And that, I cry every time I watch the yeah. opening of Abrams' first movie yeah. when, when uh, Chris Hemsworth dies. But I'm wondering, when you make a new film and you're continuing the storyline, what is the balance of using the first theme but also bringing in new themes to your storyline. And where is that balance for you? You know, it was really interesting because uh, Chiquino's score in 09, um, I can tell you that's one of my favorite scores in the last 35 years. One of the greatest years. scores of all time. Yeah. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember talking to Michael, and I think when, usually when, you sh you know, when we're shooting and editing this, we're temping a lot of the music before Michael really starts recording and stuff, right? Mm. And so... We had this amazing library of Michael Cicchino uh, uh, scores, a lot of it from the first two movies. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, wow, like I, I, don't, I think it's going to be pretty easy for him because we already have an amazing score and we can just kind of evolve it. So I sit down with Michael and Michael's like, I got new themes for Jayla. We got new themes, you know, for, for Yorktown and, and the state of, and I tell you, it, he was so amazing. That conversation to me you know, when he could have just rested and said, oh, let's just evolve this theme a little bit and, mm. and, and let's go two and a half years into it. He was not, he wasn't going to rest. And that kind of energy, I felt like, kind of embodied what everybody was doing on this, on this film, you yeah. know? And so to be able to sit with him and for him to say, no, I'm not, this is not good enough. Like we had to, you know, at one point he was gonna strip away everything wow. and start all over. No, you need that one yeah. piece, man. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so we were trying to like find that balance and he was so great to work with, you yeah. know? And a lot of times I'm like, wait, I'm arguing you to use more <laughs> of you, you know? Like, but that just shows you what a committed and talented and, and great collaborator he is, yeah. you know? And I, I was very, I'm very grateful to have uh, uh, to have the opportunity to work with him. That theme destroys me, yeah. man. It's yeah. a great theme. Justin, yeah. thank you hey, so man. much. I do want to ask you guys about your accents because they're they're so fascinating to meet you guys in real in real life and then hear your accents in the movie. And I'm wondering, in between takes, do you stay in the accent? No. Never? No. You just go back to your normal accent? You can, you can go in and out that quickly? Mm -hmm. For you as well? Yeah, I, I'm not particularly method as an actor. And I, I live with the Scottish person, so I, it's, it's something I hear very often you know it's hmm. i can draw and you know when you spend a lot of time in the states don't you yeah. i find sometimes when we do star trek you the twang mm -hmm. lasts longer with you like you so your kiwi accent when we're off not doing star trek comes back stronger and when we are doing star trek your american intonation hovers slightly and i think that's like you're in you're because you're always ready to engage it well, but we never do it like huh. it's never like a method i thing, also yeah. though but part of that is uh, a need to be understood you know because quite often you'll go to starbucks say and you'll order a coffee and <laughs> as soon as they hear a foreign accent they're like whoa whoa, whoa sorry uh, say that again <laughs> and you will inevitably end up repeating yourself so <laughs> I will just speak it with an American dialect. That's cool. Don't ask for bread and butter in a restaurant yeah. in America because I don't know what the hell you're talking about. No, one thing I love brilliantly about the script is the idea of how Justin and, and, the, and, the, screen, and the screenplay actually handles Sulu's character and how it's such a simple scene. It's not over the top. It's literally right there. You just It's a normalcy, which mm -hmm. is the way it needs to be in films. And I'm wondering, does that affect at all the first two movies? Because John Cho doesn't didn't know that in the first two movies you made. Yeah. So does that change anything at all, or is that something that was built in? You think it would, Ab Abrams already kind of had built in? I No, I don't think it was, but I also don't think his sexual orientation would have affected any, any of the decisions he made in the, right. you know, in, in the first two films. Um, the it point was, we're making is that we're not defined by our sexuality. It is a part of who we are, but it is not our defining uh, aspect or feature. And I think that, you know, John, uh, that Sulu didn't come out uh, in this film. He didn't come out of the turbo lift right. or the closet or whatever it is. Uh, you know, he, he just is. He just is. And I think it'd be great for people. We've had so many, so much response from young men and women who, who suddenly mm. feel a degree of representation they haven't felt before. Yeah. I love the fact that they'll go back and watch Into Darkness in 09 now and think, hey, that guy... He's like me, you know, yeah. doing all that crazy stuff because you can have a gay hero and you can have someone, you know, it's so easy to stereotype in movies. And what I wanted to do, what Doug and I wanted to do with, with making it Sulu was have it feel like it had just been around 
forever. And like you say, it was it was a normalcy because it is a normal. That's why I loved it because it wasn't it was presented as just a normalcy, which is the way I think all movies should have it. I have one more question for you about the scene when uh, Quinto transports in front of you, and I'm wondering how Justin gets that shot. Is it is uh, does he run out of the frame like does he yeah. do? <laughs> yeah, basically that's what happens. It's, it's like, okay, now get out of there, Zach. Then he'll get out, and then we pause for a beat, and then we continue the scene, and uh, yeah, and they just uh, edit it out. But, uh, it was a lot of fun. I like what they've done with the transporter uh, field in this. They've made it it's slightly different now. It's kind of almost like an interference. It's like, it's a nice little little evolution yeah. of it. The sets were insane. You guys did a great job. Congratulations to you Thank guys. Thanks, Thank you so Thanks, much buddy. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Pleasure.